This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at really what's a unique notebook on the market. This is the Sony Vio Z, or Z3, because this is the third generation of the Sony Vio Z. This is running on Intel Ivy Bridge third generation CPU. It weighs two and a half pounds, and it's smarter than most every notebook on the planet. Very good looking. Incredibly light, two and a half pounds. Definitely a machine to die for. We're going to look at it now. So this is the third generation Sony Vio Z computer, otherwise known as the Z3 among folks who follow this line of computers because, well, it's the third generation. It runs on Intel Ivy Bridge, just coming out now. You can get it with a Core i5 and Core i7 CPU, and those are full mobile CPUs. Those are not the ultra-low voltage, uh, less smart, less fast CPUs that are used on Ultrabooks, so that's what sets this guy apart. First, let's take a look at the looks. It's a lot like the Z2, the outgoing model. Carbon fiber lid here, a little hard to see the pattern, but very nice striations on the pattern. Typical Sony, kind of understated modern design. It's also available in gold. Sony seems to like gold. I'm not sure how many people buy that. And there's a $50 upcharge for the premium carbon fiber finish that's a little bit shinier. And on the back, where we have the contrasting silver strip, that will be in black also if you get the premium finish. Now as I'm holding it up you can see absurdly thin, 0.66 inches, very thin. We're talking ultrabook territory. This weighs two and a half pounds, lighter than most ultrabooks. Yet it's about as fast as my HP NV15 other than the graphics and we'll get into that in depth in a while. You might notice these rubber feet here on the ends, right there and there. And then, so when you open up the lid, it actually props up the computer a little bit for a better typing angle. Also good because it raises it up and it exposes these vents for cooling over here. Speaking of cooling, as we look at the underside, you can see we've got two fans here. Inside, there's copper housing for those, copper heat sinks that run to your CPU and integrated GPU. So you can see more air vents over here. And one thing I want to say is that the, the outgoing Z2 model, one thing people didn't like about it, the fan was very noisy and kind of had an annoying pitch. This guy runs much cooler. It helps that it is running that 22 nanometer Ivy Bridge CPU that's running at 35 watts rather than the old 45 watts, so the thing runs cooler, uses less power, also runs faster. Good times. This section over here is the battery, and you can see these oversized screws over here. These are so you could actually use like a coin or something like that to unscrew them, and this is where the battery lives. So it's not your usual, you pop the battery out easily and replace it kind of thing. It takes some work to get at it, but it is somewhat accessible. And the rest of the screws here are for removing the bottom. It's pretty easy to take this apart, but there's not much point to doing that because pretty much everything is soldered on the relatively small motherboard on board. And this battery capacity is 4,000 milliamps. You can get the sheet battery sold separately, or there's also bundles available with this notebook. And that adds another 4,400 milliamps, a little bit more than double your run times, and that costs $150. Now, speaking of bundling, this has gotten more affordable. It's still an expensive notebook, but Sony used to bundle it with the Media Dock, which adds a Blu-ray player or a Blu-ray burner, depending on which option you go for. There's also a CD drive-only option, port replicator, and all that kind of thing that connects to the Light Peak connector, which is uh, the early implementation of Thunderbolt. That thing costs about 400 bucks, so that brought this up to starting price of $2,000. No more are you required to get that, so the starting price is now $1,599. Pricey, yes, but not astronomical. Now, there are still bundles, we, bundles where you can get that dock, and you can get the sheet battery and all that stuff, so you can still get yourself up to 3000 bucks if you're trying by getting the highest specs available internally in this and getting that stuff. I would not buy that dock right now. Uh, outside this country, there's an updated dock that's already available. It's not in the U.S. yet, but that one's going to update the graphics card, because with this guy, it's too thin to actually have dedicated graphics. That requires not just more space, but a lot more cooling. Not room for that here. So the dock actually has a dedicated graphics card, and that's going to get updated soon for those of you who want it. I think another reason Sony is not bundling this with the dock is because it has Intel HD 4000 graphics. You've probably heard about how improved that is. That's the new integrated graphics card for Ivy Bridge, and performance is so much faster than anything that came before in terms of Intel integrated graphics. And on synthetic benchmarks, this benchmark is about as fast as the dedicated graphics option that was available through the media dock before with this. So yes, you can actually do some gaming. As we look around, so you can see what it is you're getting for your money here. You know how most Ultrabooks, they don't have many ports. They generally don't have Ethernet, they have maybe micro HDMI, sometimes full size, not too much. Well, you're going to see a lot of ports on here, relatively speaking, for something this thin and this light. You can see right here we've got 
our headphone mic combo stereo jack. This comes with noise canceling earbuds made by Sony. Here's your Ethernet jack for Gigabit Ethernet that pops down because the notebook is too thin to actually accommodate the jack without doing that, and that's something Sony's been doing for a couple of years now. You've got your full size HDMI port here. You've got two USB ports. One's USB 2.0 sleep and charge, and the other is USB 3.0. If you do get the dock, that's going to plug into the 3.0 port and also the power connector. And the dock comes with a bigger power charger because it's going to be powering both the dock and the notebook computer. And the dock has uh, additional USB ports, two USB 2.0, one 3.0, and full-size HDMI and audio out, so it replicates that stuff. So you don't have to worry so much about the fact you've just given up this USB port right here. This side, not too much going on. You can see the copper heat sink and fan on, under here, and we've got large air exhaust area. We've got lock slot, and we have actually a VGA port. Sony still manages to find a way to get a VGA port on these fairly thin machines. And you can see the design here, very angular, very interesting, kind of nice. We've got this cut off here, we've got this here. Nobody's ever going to accuse Sony of making something that looks like a MacBook Air, will they? And on the front edge, we have memory stick duo slot, Sony will never let go of that, will they? And a SD card slot as well, full size SD card slot. Stick the card in, it goes pretty much all the way in so it's not sticking halfway out in an annoying kind of fashion. And you have indicators here for hard drive access, charging, and your wireless radios. So that's the externals of the Vio Z. You can see interesting design here, carbon fiber panel. We have the little reinforced area over here. The display is not Gorilla Glass S because for years Sony has been actually designing their Vio Z and Vio T's to have flex in them so they can flex instead of just crack and break. So there's the answer to that. That said, this is a, a very rigid machine. It feels sturdy enough. Um, it's not exactly like the Dell XPS 13 where you feel like you could use that for a hammer if you wanted to, but I wouldn't be too worried about this guy with normal laptop care. And if we open it up, you can see just how thin that display panel is. That's a striking look, certainly. So we open up and take a look inside. Again, it looks a lot like the Z2 if you've seen that one in stores. Very nice, relatively speaking, a large keyboard for something that is a 13.1 inch display. Island style keyboard, very nice for typing, backlit. It uses the ambient light sensor to set the backlighting for you. It automatically goes to sleep if you've not been typing for a while. You touch a key, it comes back on. So pretty efficient, it's not always on, it's not always glaring at you. It, it adjusts pretty well. And we've got this interesting trackpad here, which you can see it's not very large, but it works very well. Now, Windows trackpad software is often kind of iffy, but this one does nicely. First off, I like the textures a lot. The bottom mouse click area here is quite glossy, so you feel the difference right away. If your finger has wandered off the touchpad area and gone to here, you, tactile feedback tells you immediately. And this has this interesting kind of a textured fishnet kind of pattern on it, so you, again, can feel it. And this is your fingerprint scanner right here in the middle, separating your mouse buttons, which lack any other kind of physical separation. And I've noticed that this is less sensitive than the Vio Z2 to accidentally being triggered, the, the TPM here and fingerprint scanner, so I haven't had any problem with it going wonky and uh, thinking that I'm trying to log in somewhere or something like that. So it works out very well. Nicely done. I would call this a little element of humanistic design. These things are done basically for your tactile feedback and, and information so you can use this small trackpad more easily. Good going there. Again, you got the two SD card slots here. And as we move up top here, you can see we've got not just the on-off button right here in the far corner, which is illuminated green when it's turned on. It lights up on the side a little bit too. But we have three capacitive buttons over here. Now, one's labeled Assist, and that brings up Viocare, so you can do things like do software updates, make recovery disks, all that kind of thing. The middle one is labeled web. Again, they're capacitive. They don't move or anything like that. But if the computer is turned off and you just hit the web button, it'll make a little click. So you know that you clicked it, which is, again, kind of a nice little humanistic design element there, even though nothing has moved. And it's going to boot up the computer just like that, since it's running on an SSD drive, and launch the web browser. It almost makes it seem superfluous that it has a regular dedicated power button in a way, because just about everybody these days is using the web browser. So it's kind of one key, just tap that capacitive button, boots right up, launches i.e. Lastly, there's the VIO button, which is assignable. You can assign any application that you want to it. And here we just have caps lock indicators, that kind of thing. And up here we have our usual FN controls for things like volume and display brightness and all that kind of stuff. And we have embedded page up and down that share space with the arrow keys. 
Now besides the horsepower of the unit, the other thing that really sets this apart from pretty much every other notebook on the planet is the display. Now this is a 1080p display in a 13.1 inch computer. And Sony sets the font size up to 125% by default in Windows to make it more readable. Because the DPI is so high, fonts are incredibly sharp, and it's actually more readable than I would have expected. I thought, well, man, I'm not going to be able to see this display anymore. I don't have such great eyes. But I can see it just fine. Of course, you can do things like zooming in your web browser and, and setting your zoom in Word and all those other applications that you use if you need to. But the real glory here, again, this is a computer for folks who are, say, graphics professionals doing video editing, that kind of thing. And you need full 1080p. You need all that real estate. You're editing photos in Photoshop, some serious raw SLR images, or you're doing 1080p video footage editing here. You got what you need. The other nice thing is it's quite bright, and it has an unusually wide color gamut. Color gamut, for those of you who don't know, means that it displays as many of the colors possible as our eyes can see. Now, your average notebook display, you're looking at about 30... 5 to 40 percent color gamut. That means you're only, it only displays about 35 to 40 percent of the colors that your eyes can actually see. This one, 92 percent. So for those of you who are, again, professional video editors, uh, photo editors, that kind of thing, where color accuracy is wildly important, this is the machine for you. And for those of us who just really like a fast, light computer and have the money to spend on this kind of thing, the other upside is you see colors that you never really saw before. It's kind of eye-opening, forgive the pun. Just this desktop right here, I have never realized just how vibrant that blue is, and this is one of those standard Windows desktops. I've looked at uh, video trailers, things like that, and wow, the colors are just so vibrant, and, the, and again, just the wide gamut of colors is, is eye-opening. You almost feel like you'd rather watch the movie on this than go see it in the movie theater, because well, you're seeing more colors here. It really is nice looking. Contrast levels are also extremely high, very good black levels. Awesome screen to watch Blu-ray movies on, or 1080p video streams that you ripped, anything like that. Of course, there is no internal optical drive, no room here. That got axed in the old days, Vio Z line did have that kind of thing, but this has moved sort of towards the old Sony Vio X concept, if you remember that. That was a really thin, light, carbon fiber computer, but at the time it ran on an Intel Atom CPU, because that's all you could fit into such a small chassis. Times have sure changed in five years or so, what we can get inside of here now. And let's talk about that. For $15.99 for the base model, you get a Core i5 mobile CPU, third generation Ivy Bridge. And again, that's not the ultra low voltage ULV CPU that's used in Ultrabooks. That is a full mobile CPU that you'd find in a large notebook. If you get the i5, it's a 2.5 gigahertz. And that's the Intel Core i5-3210M for those of you who track that. And it has turbo boots up to 3.1 gigahertz. That has 4 megs of level 2 cache, very fast CPU, and this one right here is the Core i7 model. Now what's nice is, before the, the Z2, if you got the Core i7, it was still a dual core, Core i7. Now we're full quad core here, folks, and this thing is very, very fast. That runs on the Core i7 3612QM. It's 2.1 gigahertz, which with turbo boost up to 3.1 gigahertz. Uh, again, this is as fast as, say, something like the HP NV15 that we reviewed, uh, which is a, obviously a 15.6-inch notebook, and even there it was pretty impressive to see that much power in something that was only 15.6 inches. So you're looking at the computing power of a very good high-end 15 to 17-inch notebook crammed here into 2.5 pounds and 13.1 inches. Again, who is this for? This is for folks who need to edit video, who work with large Photoshop files, all the Adobe Suite applications, that kind of stuff, are doing development, CAD work, that kind of stuff. If you just want to do Word, Excel, web browsing, your email, that kind of thing, this is overkill. You really don't need all this processing power. But that, that's what you're paying for, for the money. For those of you who think, well, why is Sony charging so much for this when you can get an Ultrabook for $1,000? It does a heck of a lot more, and, well, it's also thinner and lighter than some Ultrabooks, in fact, most Ultrabooks on the market right now. Again, this is running on Intel HD 4000 integrated graphics, and that was the big improvement with Ivory Bridge. Really, if you're going to run something with dedicated graphics, who cares about that so much? But for notebook computers that are depending on integrated graphics, huge step up. I, like I said, that's why Sony really isn't pushing that bundle dock anymore with dedicated graphics, because you're getting just about that level of performance here. We're going to have a separate video demoing this, doing some things like playing Skyrim at 35 to 40 FIPS at full. 1080p resolution. We're not talking the 1366 by 768 resolution we usually step down to when reviewing other notebooks. 
For those of you using Adobe Creative Suite applications, they typically support Intel Integrated Graphics pretty well. So we're seeing pretty good performance right now in Creative Suite. We expect it's only going to get better as they optimize for the features in the HD 4000. So I've found it just bang up great to use for Photoshop, Illustrator, all those kinds of applications. And again, 1080p video editing with a Core i7, four cores working for you. Yeah, it's definitely very possible. That's something that you just wouldn't do on an Ultrabug. It's pretty hard to find anything that's small and light that can really edit 1080p video competently unless you've got, well, a couple of hours to spend on waiting for it to render. As we mentioned, pretty much everything is soldered onto the motherboard with this guy. It has 8 gigs of RAM. That's standard. It's soldered on the motherboard. You can't get it with less. You can't get it with more right now. 8 gigs is pretty good. I mean, most Notebooks these days are coming with 4 gigs, 8 gigs is enough for those of you who are doing video editing or some serious gaming. If you're just doing Word, Excel, PowerPoint, that kind of stuff, and web, 4 gigs would actually be just fine. And SSD only. Now this is Sony's custom SSD that they've been doing for quite some time, their own design, and very, very, very good performance. On benchmarks it really wipes away even things like the Samsung PM830, which is one of the fastest SSDs on the market right now that's used in the Dell XPS 13, and you can also buy it as a module to use with uh, SATA drive connectors. You can get this with 128, 256, or 512 gigs of storage. 128 is what comes with the base level machine for $15.99. If you go up to about 1950 to 1999, you get the 256 gig, which really, that gives you room to breathe and install a bunch of applications. If you can afford that luxury, that is one of the more expensive upgrades, but it's nice. 512 gigs, you're looking at you're adding at least $400 onto the cost there, ouch. And the difference between the Core i5 and Core i7 is about $150, but again, they have bundles with the Core i7, the 256 gig, and the 8 gigs of RAM prepackaged if you want that. You can get with Windows 7 Home Premium or Professional if you go for that $19.99 bundle that gets you the Core i7, the 256 gig SSD, 8 gigs of RAM, then you get Windows 7 Professional. Also, uh, Microsoft has a promotion going. Anybody who buys a PC app June 2nd or afterwards gets an upgrade to Windows 8 Professional for $15. So, not too much to worry about there. You'll get it in the mail from Microsoft. Thank you very much. Other goodies include a 1.3 megapixel webcam up here with Sony's Exomore sensor. It takes better webcam video than the average computer, certainly. Built-in microphone with some noise-canceling technology. Again, those noise-canceling earbuds are also included in the box. And that's a good thing because the speakers on this guy, oh, are they quiet and tinny. That is not one of the strong points of this notebook. Now, some manufacturers have managed to really give us some pretty impressive audio in a small form factor. Like I'm thinking of the Dell XPS 13, which could really rip your ears off if you crank up the volume on it. Not this one. Thin and tinny. But the minute you plug in some headphones, very, very nice sound. Viewing angles on this, by the way, are very good. They're much above the average notebook computer. Not IPS level wide viewing angles, though. That's okay with me because I really don't want the guy in the airplane next to me reading what's on my screen particularly. It's wide enough for comfortable viewing. It's not like one of those notebooks where you have to constantly tilt it back and forth to try to get the right viewing angle. And I'll take the wide color gamut, brightness, and just lusciousness of this display, by the way, anti-glare coating on it any day. It also does tip back fairly far for those of you who want to do that kind of thing. And I'll just show you it goes that far back, which is fairly flat. There is some flex here. Again, Sony has designed it to flex so it bends without breaking. Right now we're just sitting here with this computer at idle and you can hear the fan is really not audible at all. And it runs at about oh, 58 degrees centigrade on average at idle, and even with a light to moderate workload, which is fairly cool. Maximum allowed for the CPU is 105 degrees centigrade. Now let's take a look at how it performs. We're going to do, obviously this can handle this, but this is a 1080p movie trailer, but you can see full screen 1080p. You're actually going to see the, the whole video right here. So here we've got a 1080p movie trailer running, uh, beautiful colors again, luscious, nice contrast, good deep blacks, and as you can tell, those speakers are really pretty quiet, so again, you probably want to use a set of headphones. And we're at about a little over half volume right now, and that's maximum volume. You can see Sony software bundle in here, and a couple of things that we put on, we put on Creative Suite 5.5 runs beautifully. As I said, we've got Intel Wide Eye software here, so you can wirelessly display the contents of your screen on your HDTV if you've got a little Wide Eye box. 
And for so many applications, you know, they used to be the kings of bloatware. It got kind of disgusting. They have really calmed down. We've got their media gallery here. We've got Viogate, which is a little launcher up here I'll show you in a minute, which seems mm, kind of pointless to me. Bio smart media transfer stuff that's designed to make it easier to import from your not just Sony brand but any camera or camcorder and put it on your hard drive. There's also some basic video editing stuff on here and photo editing stuff, which is nice for the the more casual user. But given the target market for this product, probably most of you are going to be using more serious applications. Nonetheless, it's there. And one of the nice things is they actually give you an uninstaller for all of this stuff now, and we'll show you that in a second. We've also got. Cyberlink Power DVD for Blu-ray drives here. Blu-ray drivers are pre-installed. And a month trial of Kaspersky Internet Security 2012. And of course, via Play Memories Home. Another thing you can do with this is use it as the world's most expensive keyboard for your PS3. It has a remote application installed on here. You can pair it up with your PS3 and use this as the keyboard for your PS3. And we've also got Sony's little utility here, this little bouncy around thing here. It really doesn't slow down things much, but it's a secondary launching dock. You can see it comes pre-populated with Skype because they bundle Skype on this. We've got Power DVD, IE, all those kind of things. And you can customize what's on here, but it's a little bit superfluous. So, well, of course, you can remove this if you want, because otherwise, every once in a while, you're going to mouse over there and see this bouncing around, unless you think that's entertaining, watching and follow your cursor. So this is what BioCare looks like, and it can give you troubleshooting help with these various categories here, nice and graphically. You can go and get software updates, driver updates, you can make recovery, all available over here. And here's an uninstalled software. So here it is. You can update your Vio software that came bundled, and you can remove anything that you don't want. So for those of you who just kind of hate an untidy computer and worry that things going to be left behind, the Vio uninstaller in BioCare takes care of that for you. In terms of benchmarks, you can see we have our Windows Experience Index score up here, and the lowest score is a very good 6.5. That's for graphics, for 3D gaming, and for Arrow. We've got maximum for disk data transfer rate, 7.9. CPU is at 7.5. Memory is at 7.8. So fast stuff there. Now, what's really exciting is PC Mark Vantage Benchmark. We scored 17,000 with this. 17,000. Usually, when you hit about 10,000, you're pretty excited and say, hey, you got a fast notebook computer there. Now, the SSD speed does make a difference. For example, some Ultrabooks, which really aren't the fastest guys on the planet compared to full-size notebooks, will score up to 10,000 if they have a very fast SSD drive. But 17,000 is pretty rare. That beats my HP NV15 by many thousands of points. Now, again, if you're going to do some serious gaming and you have a gaming GPU in there, uh, Benchmarks can be a little bit misleading. This is not going to play Skyrim at 60 FIPS with high quality settings. No. Low quality settings, you, like I said, you'll, you'll get 35 to 40 or so, but nonetheless. That also compares very favorably to the second generation Vio Z2, which benchmarked at about 12,000, which was pretty impressive in its day, but well, gee, 12,000 ain't 17,000, is it? On 3D Mark Vantage, we scored 4,000 with this. 4,000 is just about the same as the dedicated GPU available in the separate media box for this computer. 4,000 is pretty good. That's why you can do some moderate 3D gaming with this and also work with Adobe Creative Suite applications. And again, that's about twice as fast as the outgoing Vio Z2. In contrast, in the HP Envy, which has a very nice upper mid-range dedicated graphics card since that is aimed at the multimedia and gaming audience, 3D Mark Vantage on that was 6,500 versus 4,000 on this. And now so you can see what it's like to edit images. We're in Adobe Photoshop CS 5.5 here. We're importing a RAW file that's about 30 megs in size. And we've got our usual preview thing going on here. We've got lens correction turned on and all that kind of stuff. So play with those sliders. It's instantly responsive. Come on exposure, brighten that up. Oop, a little too much. You can see it's all very real time for that. And we'll open that image. And this is stored on an SD card right now. I had a second image waiting in the background there. That was what that was. And we want to zoom in a little bit. Let's go to 50% instantaneous. Auto contrast quick. Let's do a strange filter on this. Let's try something like. No, let's do something normal actually. A little unsharp mask there, default settings. Just like that. No waiting, no nothing. Of 
quick image rotation. It can handle anything that Photoshop offers. Obviously, since there's an optional bundled Blu-ray player, it can handle playing Blu-rays just fine if you've got a Blu-ray drive plugged in. It has dual band advanced and Intel Wi-Fi 802.11bgn Bluetooth 4.0. Now it's time for some comparisons. The only obvious competitor to the Z because it's in it's such a unique category would be the Lenovo ThinkPad X230 right here. This is Intel's refreshed Ivy Ridge version of their 12.5 inch ThinkPad model. And you can see size-wise in, in terms of footprint like this, they're pretty similar. The Sony is a bit more widescreen so it's going to hang out on the end just a teeny bit more. The Lenovo, this is the matte display, really nice display on it and it's IPS as well. 1366 by 768 is the resolution though. No 1080p option available for Lenovo. Lenovo has that great ThinkPad keyboard. A Typist Dream, more travel. You can see it's, it's not nearly as flat as the Sony's though. In terms of price, the Lenovo sells, starts at about $1,000, so it starts out cheaper, but if you start to configure it to be what this, this Sony has, you're looking at pretty much the same price. If you were to configure the Lenovo to, to have pretty much the same specs as the Sony, of course not the 1080p display because that's not an available option, you're looking at getting up to about the same price, $1,600, if you want to get a large capacity SSD drive, though right now uh, Lenovo is not going up to 256 or 512 options just yet. But adding that, adding a Core i7, all that kind of thing. So, again, both of these are for somebody who's looking for an incredibly powerful computer that's very, very roadworthy, very light. The Lenovo weighs 3.3 to 3.4 pounds with the 6-cell battery, so it's about a pound heavier. It's funny, when we reviewed this, this Lenovo seemed incredibly light to me, and now after handling the Sony, it seems awful heavy. If we take a look at what they look like closed, the big difference here is going to be the thickness. That's one thing. The Lenovo is not what you would call a chic computer, nor is it particularly thin. And here we have them on top of each other, and quite a difference there in thickness. Obviously, style is a matter of personal taste. Probably the Sony is more mainstream, uh, incredibly stylish, versus the ThinkPad, which if you're a ThinkPad person, you, you love the look. Otherwise, most people say, oh, what a boring black box. Neither of these notebooks has an eSATA option or a Thunderbolt option. A uh, bummer. Again, Sony uses the Light Peak, which is kind of the earlier version of what became Thunderbolt that's used on the Macs. And that uses the USB port, 3.0 port, physically, and then it does fiber optic communication there. And Thunderbolt ended up being mini display port with a regular copper wire running inside. But anyway. One thing I do like about the Lenovo is it has a display port on it. Display port's handy if you want to drive really large monitors. Again, something that you graphics professionals are probably interested in doing. With the Sony, you just have HDMI out, so you're limited to the 1920 by 1080 for your external monitor resolution. And now, though, these machines are really in a different class. We have to have our gratuitous 13-inch MacBook Air 2011 model comparison right here. And, of course, the Mac tapers, so, well, that's now a patented feature if you've been reading the news to very thin on the front, so it's going to look a lot thinner, but on the side, the thickest point is as thick as the Sony's, at least on paper, are pretty close. Both very attractive looking computers, both very well made. MacBook Air starts out cheaper, but again, it's really not a proper comparison because the MacBook Air is still, in essence, an Ultrabook. Maybe an early Ultrabook, it may not go by that Intel moniker, but the MacBook Air has a ULV CPU. It is much less powerful. I'm sure it eventually will be refreshed to Ivy Bridge, so we're still looking at last second generation technology inside here. So you have Intel HD 3000 graphics, not nearly as powerful again. So really, they're in a different class. The MacBook Air is great for everyday kind of computing needs. It's not for somebody who needs a powerful computer. Then you look at the MacBook Pro, you look at the Sony, you look at other solutions. And when you start to look at the MacBook Pro, you're also raising up your price point again to get something more powerful. And while we're doing comparisons, however appropriate or perhaps inappropriate, but here's the Dell XPS 13. Metal lid, carbon fiber on the bottom, just like the Sony, but this one lets the carbon fiber pattern show through, with, uh, which us car geeks happen to love. But very sturdy, very well made, Gorilla Glass display. Again, 1366 by 768 on this guy, and it has a glossy display, so lots of glare and uh, much more limited viewing angles and doesn't have the wide color gamut. It's still, it's great for everyday computing use. It's a pleasing enough display and reasonably powerful, but this is also running a second generation ULV CPU, so it's going to be a lot slower. 
But in terms of size, you can see this is, it has one of the smallest footprints of any Ultrabook, so it's actually a little bit smaller than the Sony. And from the side view, a little bit thinner since it's got a taper going on there. And the Dell weighs about three pounds, so it's about a half a pound heavier. Imagine that. The Dell has two USB ports, one 3.0, one 2.0. It has a mini display port. Again, good for those of you who want to drive very large monitors. It does not have an Ethernet port, so you have to use a USB Ethernet dongle adapter if you want to use that. And the Dell does not have an HDMI port, though you can get a $20 adapter that takes the mini display port and turns it into HDMI. By the way, we now have an SD card in the slot, and you can see that it really doesn't stick out much at all, so not too much of an annoyance there. So that's the third generation Sony Vio Z or Z3 and that is the SVZ13 model for those of you who are going to be looking by the model number for this. And again, it's it's still as ever in a unique place among notebook computers. This is your aggressive desktop replacement plus the lightest computer you can possibly carry around. So there aren't really many computers, if any computers, that fall into that category. The Lenovo ThinkPad X230 would be the closest. So yes, it costs more, but that's what you're getting for the price. You're getting incredible portability, yet a whole lot of power you might expect to see in a pretty decent, not too cheap, 15.6 to 17 inch computer. Is it lovely? Is it to die for? Certainly it is. You know, every time a new Z comes out, every reviewer falls in love with it. And so do a lot of customers who run out and buy one, but it is still expensive. We're really happy that Sony debundled the multimedia dock with it to bring down the price by $400, but you're still looking at $1,600 and up for this computer. But if you need that kind of processing power and something that actually is fairly future-proof, which is, isn't something you get to say very often with notebook computers, well, this would be it. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the review of the Sony Vio Z 2012 edition and subscribe to our YouTube channel.